Hi, I'm Peter Lee for NewsBud's China Watch. Anti-Trump narratives dominated coverage of Trump's call with China's Xi Jinping and meetings with Japan's Shinzo Abe. But it looks like the media missed and messed up some of the big stories. But first, in last week's China Watch, I said, And don't be an idiot, Zhong Yun. Don't test an ICBM toward the United States. Well, he wasn't a dummy. The DPRK did do a missile test, as expected, but not an ICBM. Instead, they fired a medium-range missile that splashed down in the ocean between North Korea and Japan and avoided directly antagonizing the United States. Pretty good. Back to Trump. It was a busy week for the Trump administration in Asia. Secretary of Defense Mattis swung through Asia and reaffirmed the core U.S. security policies in North Korea, Japan, and the South China Sea. Donald Trump sent a letter and made a phone call with China's President Xi Jinping. And Trump hosted Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. It was a good week for professionalism, continuity, and moderation in U.S.-Asia policy. So anti-Trump media had to dig a little deeper for the necessary anti-Trump narrative. We'll start with the latest news, the Abe-Trump press conference in Washington on February 10. This event seemed to cause some heartburn to the never-Trump sector because Trump did not play his assigned role of buffoon held in contempt by the entire world. Instead, he was reasonably controlled and presidenti and in a position of advantage in his exchanges with a very deferential Prime Minister Abe, who obsequiously praised Donald's golf game. Journalists had to make do with mocking the prolonged Trump-Abe handshake, which had to be held for an uncomfortable 19 seconds to accommodate the photographers and Abe's reaction. As for the Trump-Abe press conference, for me, it was most notable for what it didn't have. What was missing was a lot of palaver about East Asian security. In fact, when Trump got a question about security or the South China Sea, he often just blew right by it in order to talk at length about what really seems to be on his mind, the economy and jobs. I got the impression that slotting a couple more Japanese auto plants into the United States is going to work wonders for the U.S.-Japan relationship. Prime Minister Abe got that impression too. The main takeaway from the visit was the kickoff of a U.S.-Japan economic dialogue and the promise that Japan's gigantic pension fund is going to invest in U.S. infrastructure projects and help create 700,000 U.S. jobs. No fake news there, I'm sure. It looks to me like Trump's Asian priorities right now are economic, obtaining wins on investment and trade that he can use to reward his supporters and obtain political traction for his presidency. And that's probably what he's looking at with China right now, some mixture of threats and firmness to get the PRC to open its wallet and give the Trump administration some wins in exchange for reasonably good relations setting up an economic competition between Japan and China to bid for the favorable attention of the United States is probably not the dumbest thing Trump has ever done. And I don't think Trump's interested in screwing up that scenario right now by fighting a war to push back China. Which brings us to the trump Xi phone call that took place on Thursday, February 9. Here I'll make the point that it looks like U.S. foreign policy reporting has deteriorated under Trump. That's because Trump has not only rejected Obama policy, he's also rejected Obama advisors, Obama think tanks, and Obama journalists. The big U.S. papers like the New York Times and Washington Post are in a difficult position of trying to maintain their credibility as authoritative news sources on American politics at the same time they're in an adversarial relationship with the president and his administration. I think some of what you read today is news, some is informed speculation, some is wishful thinking, and some is well poisoning by journalists with no access, interviewing ex-officials with no access, and think tanks with no access. Quality can suffer. The big China news in the middle of the week was that Trump had sent a friendly letter to Xi Jinping a multitude of outlets spun this as some combination of snub and blunder, since Trump was telephoning numerous world leaders, but somehow couldn't get on the phone with Xi. 
Well, the Chinese foreign ministry said China highly appreciated the note, said a lot of friendly things, and when asked about the snub angle, stated, this kind of remark is meaningless. Not too meaningless for the New York Times, which ran one of those stories about how she was shunning Trump on the day the call actually went down. Trump got his copy of the New York Times and pounced. The Times defense was that the paper got printed before the call and Trump got his copy after the call. Whatever. The relevant point is that the Times was completely blindsided by the call and had to scramble to update its coverage. Bigly. One can also speculate that maybe the New York Times is getting sandbagged by Team Trump. In other words, the Times was getting fed disinformation as to the progress and tempo of the talks in order to discredit it. So when you read the papers today, you have to consider the possibility that not only has big media access deteriorated, its reporters are maybe also getting their chains maliciously yanked by the Trump people they can talk to. A similar pattern of reportage occurred with the readout of the Trump Xi phone call, which included a positive Trump statement on the one China policy. The one China policy at the end of the day is an indication that the United States will not recognize an independent Taiwan. Since the US government readout of the Trump call acknowledged the one China policy, most outlets presented it as an embarrassing backtrack by Trump. Since Trump had previously said everything, including one China, was on the table. Well, it's time for some readout parsing. First of all, it is a tradition that China and the United States each provide differing readouts to presidential phone calls. That way, each party gets to emphasize the points it feels are important and fudge the ones that might embarrass it in front of its domestic audience. On the one China policy, here's what the Chinese said, per Xinhua, the official Chinese news agency. Trump said he fully understands the high significance of the U.S. government's pursuit of the one China policy, adding that the U.S. government adheres to the one China policy. Here's what the U.S. government said. President Trump agreed at the request of President Xi to honor our one China policy. Now, contrast Trump's agreed to Xi's request line with the exit statement of the Obama administration in December 2016. We remain firmly committed to our one China policy. In comparison, Trump's statement makes it look like Trump graciously doing Xi Jinping a favor and quite frankly is not super respectful in presenting Xi as a supplicant. It also sounds like honoring our one China policy is a matter of Trump's personal prerogative and not acknowledgement of a core US policy. Unsurprisingly, the US readout is not being quoted in the Chinese media as far as I can tell. And it is important to note that our one China policy is not your one China policy or the one China policy. Our one China policy is that the US respects and acknowledges the PRC position that there is only one China, but does not accept it. Trump can walk that back pretty much any time he wants. Still on the table, in other words. So was Team Trump desperately spinning some last minute Trump capitulation? I tend to think the Chinese and the Trump administrations have been negotiating the conditions of the call and the spin in the readouts for some time. There was some heated, maybe vitriolic back and forth, and that's probably why the call was delayed so long. Trump's real bottom line on the one China policy had already been delivered by Secretary of State Rex Tillerson as a written follow-up to his testimony at his confirmation hearing. This was not a public statement, by the way, I'm guessing because Team Trump was still negotiating with Team Xi. Tillerson's statement was handed to Senator Cardin of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and leaked by a member of the committee staff who wanted to get Tillerson's statements on climate change into the wild. U.S.-China diplomatic confidentiality be damned. As to one China, Tillerson's statement reportedly said that the United States should continue to uphold its one China policy. Note the word should, by the way. Tillerson is credited by some with persuading Trump to get beyond should and issue the positive statement on the one China policy. I think Tillerson had some help. For one thing, on February 3, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced that National Security Advisor Michael Flynn had been in telephone consultations 
with Chinese State Counselor Yang Jiechi at Flynn's request. Maybe U.S. and Chinese negotiators worked out a consensus on the statement, the call, and the readout, and the signal that everything was cool and the phone call could be done was a letter from Trump to Xi earlier in the week. Speaking of consensus, there was an uproar in the sinosphere after the Financial Times reported that in the phone call, Trump had endorsed the 1992 consensus. That, however, is a consensus not between the United States and China. It's a consensus between Taiwan and China, and also one that the current Taiwan government has absolutely refused to affirm. Undercutting Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen on the 1992 consensus would have gutted Taiwan's mainland diplomacy and revealed Trump Taiwan policy as a hollow mockery. It also would have been a big story from the phone call, a pretty major diplomatic blunder, a tragedy for Taiwan, and strong evidence of Trump's reckless instability and unreliability. However, the idea that Trump would raise the obscure 1992 consensus in which the US has zero standing didn't make much sense. And it looks like either the Financial Times or the Financial Times source incorrectly conflated America's one China policy with the Taiwan 1992 consensus in trying to explain what was going on. Taiwan's government insisted that the Trump team, rather than stabbing Taiwan in the back, was actually keeping Taiwan in the loop. It seems the Financial Times subsequently removed the 1992 reference from its report without notice or explanation. If so, they probably owe the Taiwan government an apology, and maybe a change of underwear. In the end, the Trump-Xi phone call looks like a negotiated outcome that both sides could spin as a win. Undoubtedly, getting Trump's positive statement on the one China policy was the big get the Chinese were looking for, but it looks like Trump didn't give up much, if anything. As to the timing of the Trump-Xi call, it makes sense for Mattis to visit Asia first and affirm bedrock U.S. relations with key allies before dealing with China, which is what happened. Also, I note how the call went down just hours before the Trump-Abe meeting. If Trump was truckling to China, would he do that just before he met with Abe? Or did he want to put Abe on notice that Japan isn't America's only game in Asia? Who capitulated? Trump or she or nobody? It's an honest question. Regarding the spin in the papers, the Chinese aren't quite shunning Trump and waiting for him to crawl on his knees to them. And they don't seem to be relying on Rex Tillerson and the State Department to get their message across. In addition to the Flynn contact with Yang Jiechi, they've also worked to establish informal channels to Donald Trump, one of them notoriously through Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. Jared Kushner had partnered with Chinese heavyweights in his real estate business in the past including an investment from Alibaba's Jack Ma in one of his funds. Now, according to Bloomberg, as advisor to Trump, Kushner is holding an extensive ongoing dialogue with China's ambassador to the United States, Sui Tiankai. Kushner's wife, Ivanka Trump, made a well-publicized and favorably received New Year's call to China's Washington embassy on February 3rd with her Mandarin-speaking daughter, where she was met by Ambassador Tsui. And... Ivanka posted a video of her daughter singing a New Year's song in Mandarin. But more significantly, perhaps, China is undoubtedly using Wall Street super-duper big shot Stephen Schwartzman for VIP access to Trump. Schwartzman is the CEO of the Blackstone Group private equity firm, one of the biggest in the world. It's got $71 billion in assets under management. Blackstone was a major investment destination for China's sovereign wealth fund when it was set up, and Blackstone has done $16 billion in China-related business in the last four years, in other words, during the Xi era. In addition to his business dealings with the PRC, Schwartzman personally has a high philanthropic profile within China with the Schwartzman Scholars Program. It's a big deal, which Schwartzman funded with $100 million of his own money, plus $350 million he raised from other sources. It's explicitly modeled on the Rhodes Scholarship and is supposed to cultivate the future leaders of the U.S.-Asian partnership. It's based in China at Tsinghua University, Xi Jinping's alma mater. 
On the U.S. side, Schwartzman is not just a member of Donald Trump's strategic and policy forum. He's the chairman, and he refused to step down despite criticism from his Schwartzman scholars for cozying up to Trump. According to Nikkei, the Japanese business news outlet, Schwartzman is China's great hope for highest level access to the Trump administration. Schwartzman lunched with Xi Jinping at Davos a couple weeks ago. And as the New York Times reported, Schwartzman met at the White House with Donald Trump on February 6th. Wonder what they talked about. I got an idea. Maybe they talked about China. So maybe there are some grown-ups proficiently executing a mainstream China policy. And maybe some of the media just doesn't know very much about it. Maybe one of the most important takeaways from this week is that the media is sometimes flying blind on Trump and its coverage and sourcing need to be viewed critically and carefully. I found that the most useful and objective English language reporting on Trump Asia policy is coming out of Japan right now, via Asahi, Mainichi, Japan Times, and especially Nikkei. The access-related Trump scoops seem to be going to the Financial Times, which is now owned by Nikkei. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Of course, the main destination for insightful news and analysis on Asia is Newsbud, but you already knew that. As to where all this is headed, as I previously said, I think Trump's first priority in Asia is business. Right now, he doesn't want to lead in Asia as the pivoteers hoped. He just wants to profit from Asia diplomatically, economically, and politically by extorting trade concessions from Japan, South Korea, and China. But I suspect Trump's Asia moves are a short-term tactic. I think Trump wants to score some investment and trade deals to back up his election talk and avoid crushing losses in the 2018 midterm elections. War with China? Maybe that's for Trump's second term. Unfortunately, Trump's moderate Asia policy is bad news, I think, for Iran and the Middle East, and probably Yemen. For a Republican president, and particularly for a Republican president with a high unfavorability rating, a strong America security posture is important. If Trump wants to go into the midterms with that commander-in-chief aura, and Asia is off the table war-wise, maybe that means an earlier confrontation in the Middle East, maybe with Iran, almost certainly over Yemen. As I discussed last week on China Watch, escalation with Iran will inevitably bring Trump into conflict with China, which is an important economic and diplomatic ally of Iran and a dilemma for America's Iran sanctions strategy. I have a piece up on the Newsbud website explaining America's unending sanctions war on Iran and the tightrope Trump and China will both have to walk if Iran heats up. Speaking of sanctions, Iranian media reported last week on $18 billion in Iranian oil money that had been parked in China to evade sanctions. Iran wants to get it out of China, but apparently can't. An indication, perhaps, that if the PRC tries to get too close to Trump on Iran policy, it's going to be the subject of a lot of embarrassing, and more than embarrassing, current and sanctionable revelations concerning its clandestine economic ties with Iran. Finally, a note on the difference between good old newsbud style independent media and the other kind. Last year, there was a campaign by China Hawks in the United Kingdom to try to block one of the cornerstone deals of the UK PRC relationship, the Hinckley Sea Nuclear Power Station. Former British Foreign Secretary Malcolm Rifkind placed an op-ed in the Telegraph declaring Chinese participation in the plant made it an unacceptable security risk. Turns out, the op-ed was written by a conservative think tank called the Henry Jackson Society, and they weren't writing it for Rifkind or even for themselves. Turns out, the Henry Jackson Society had a monthly contract to do anti-PRC propaganda, and the client was the Japanese embassy in London. Be careful what you read and where you read it. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to newsbud.com where you'll find exclusive content available only to the Newsbud community. I'm Peter Lee for Newsbud's China Watch.
For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the NewsBud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from NewsBud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from NewsBud's founder, Sibel Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at NewsBud.com.